today I'm going to focus on really two topics with just a mention of the, of the first topic. Um, the first kind of minor topic is um, the code development tools for um, um, editing your source code. So in our community, there's basically a choice between using Emacs, Vim, or an IDE such as uh, Eclipse or a specialized one like uh, Microsoft um, Visual Studio. It's not so important which one you choose as becoming an expert in the one that you use and utilizing all the features that um, the editor or the ID, um, IDE has. So if your only thing you can do is type and then save a file, you're not taking advantage of the system they're using, no matter which one you're using. You want to learn and really utilize either Emacs or Vim or your IDE. Um, learn the details, because you'll find that they make things much more efficient. I'm going to show you a particular instance later in, in the slides as I do uh, some of the other work um, where this becomes apparent. But there's lots of things like this that you'll want to learn. Um, most of this presentation is going to be um, terminal-based and um, Emacs-based rather than slides. And if you have trouble seeing the uh, text, please let me know. We'll see if we can adjust it. I think it looked pretty good before. But the two topics that I'm going to talk about are using Make, and as part of that, GNU Make, and the uh, GNU AutoConf tools. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to start with a very simple project with one file and sort of start adding a little bit to the project and then showing how we can use these tools to make it simpler to manage the project as you envision this project becoming thousands of, uh, thousands of files and complicated dependencies and so forth. OK, so I'm starting with a simple C program that does basically nothing but return. It could be an equivalent Fortran. That doesn't really matter. Well, how do I build this thing? Normally, what I would do is I would just run my compiler. like so, and now I have a, a dot out. Now I run my executable. Why, is, why do I need anything more than this? If your, file is, if your program consists of a single file, you really don't need anything more than this. All you need to do is to compile it, and then you run it, and you're done. The reason for using make is when you start to have more complicated situations. Of course, my complicated situation is going to consist of three files, not 300 files, but you have to imagine the complications that come up when you have multiple files. So what I'm going to do next is I'm going to change my program a little bit and introduce another routine that I'm going to call from a separate file. And that routine is really not going to do anything, but again, it's just so I have two, two files here to work with. Well, I can try the same kind of thing again, but now it's ex2. Oh, it didn't work because I forgot that I have this other file that I need in there as well. So I can put that in there. There we go. Now I can compile OK. Now what I want to do is show you the simplest make file that can help handle this situation. So here's a very simple make file. And I'm going to go through it in a little detail. So I don't have to go through in as much detail in the later ones. I know a lot of you are comfortable with the initial part of make, and so this will seem like a review for you. Um, what this is saying is that I have an ex2 executable that depends on two source code files, ex2.c and util.c. And then the next line is the rule of how to build the executable from those two source files. And that's all there is to it. And this is not what you would put in a real make file, of course, but I'm starting at the beginning and working my way up. So now to use this make file, all I have to do is to make ex2, that is, I want to build an ex2 executable. And now, because I, I've named my make files, uh, so I have a sequence of make files as I work through this project, I have to put a dash f make file to so it knows which make file to use. Normally, you don't worry about it, it just uses make file. OK, now what it's done is gone ahead and compiled the code. Now I run that again, make again. And it actually is smart enough to go, aha, 
the X2 is up to date, so I don't actually have to rebuild. So this is already one advantage of using Make, is it's able to, if you provided enough information, to figure out what's already been compiled and not recompile, and only recompile when needs to be recompiled. And um, for two files, of course, it's totally irrelevant, but when you have 2,000 files, you don't want them all recompiled when you made one change to one file. So now let's just go and change uh, ex2.c, touch it, which means change it, and do the make again. Okay, it knows enough that it has to go in and, and recompile them. Great. Now what I'm gonna do is uh, ex3 version. Okay, what I've done now is I've changed the make file to no longer depend directly on the .c files, but instead to depend on the .o files, which are generated from the .c files, and to build the executable from the .o files instead of the .c files. The reason I've done that is because if you notice before, what happened when I changed a single C file here, it, it actually had to go and recompile both C files, which would mean all the C files. I don't want it to recompile anything that it doesn't have to recompile. So changing to this rule, what it does is it first builds the O file for EX3 and then for util, and then it links them together. And now if I run it again, it knows it doesn't have to do anything. But if I do a touch on the ex2c, uh, oops, ex3c, of course, and then I do the make, it only has to recompile the ex3, not the util file. Now I'm gonna make the package uh, slightly more complicated. by introducing an include file. Normally, you're gonna have a bunch of C files and a bunch of include files, or in the Fortran world, you're gonna have a bunch of Fortran files and then probably a bunch of modules that are generated and have to be handled kind of in the same way with dependencies. So now I've made my util4.c depend on a util4.h. And I don't actually put anything in this file. It's okay, it's just a dummy. Now I wanna work on the make file so that the proper dependency is in place for util4.h. That is, if I modify util4.h, I know I have to recompile util4.c, but I don't have to recompile ex4.c because ex4.c won't have this include in there. So let's look at the make file in that situation. Uh, all I've added to uh, the make file is a dependency of util4.0 on util4.h. So now it knows that if util4.h gets changed, util4.0 has to be rebuilt. There, it, it rebuilds everything. I run it again, it knows it doesn't have to rebuild. Now I do a touch and it knows it has to rebuild just the util4.0 uh, and then relink the uh, executable. The next thing I've done is just to clean up the make file a little bit. Rather than putting the name of the compiler directly into the rules for the make file, I've just shifted them up to make them variables at the top of the make file. And you'll see later in the presentation why I want to do this, why it makes sense to do this. And I've introduced another variable, C flags, which is just the flags I want to use to compile um, the C code by default. <laughs> make has all kinds of built in uh, rules for using these kinds of variables. So C flags is automatically uh, used to compile code with the default rules for building C code. Okay, so the code's the same as before, and 
everything should work the same way. Now you see that it's passing in the dash G automatically. Run it again, it knows that it doesn't have to rebuild. So in this example, I'm gonna show you a feature of Emacs. I'm sure there's something similar for Vim and there's definitely something in all the IDEs that makes working with the editor a little simpler when you're working with code. So I've just put an error into my uh, source code and I'm gonna build and I'm going to show you first, let's just go back to the make file, make file six. Here's my make file. Now I want to build my code. Forget all this stuff. So I try to compile and the error message pops up underneath. A really nice feature of Emacs <laughs> is it can go to where the errors are by parsing the actual error messages from the compiler. So all I have to do is control X and the back tick and it jumps to the first place where there's a source code error. If there's multiple source code errors, when I do that again, it'll go to the next one and the next one. So you don't have to go and run the make in a terminal and then go and hunt in your editor to find out where the line was that generated the error, you can jump right there. So this is an example of how it's really important to learn your tools so you can work more efficiently because you'll find that this, this kind of thing pays off enormously versus searching around for, for, to find the code. And it works if the source code's in multiple directories and so forth as well. So let's see what uh, next increment I'm gonna add here. So make files can be used for more than just compiling code. In a sense, they're like a scripting tool with certain limitations, but certain power as well. So you'll want to use um, make files to do other things related to your code management and other things as well. So here's a simple example of this. There's, for Emacs, there's a tool called eTags, and for Vim, it's just called tags, I believe. What it does is it creates an index of your source code, and then the editor can find things for you anywhere in your source code just by looking at the index. So I'll show you first at the command line, etags star.c, star, let's do star seven, star six dot c. What that does is it creates a file tags, you can look at tags, it's just a very simple um, file that more or less is, it's not really binary, just thinks it's binary. Um, that it, it's just an index of what it found in the source code and it, it's an index of all the functions that it found and so forth and the files. And what I've done over here is I've made a rule in the make file that'll generate the etags file for me so I don't have to go and manually do it. And whenever I want to update, I can just run the make etags. So to accomplish the same thing, then make etags generates the etags file. Now what can I do with the etags file? Well, let's say I want to find the function util. I just do escape period util. And it says visit tags file, that is, I have to give it the index, so I have to give it the tags file, which is in this directory here, and then it just jumps right there. Or if I want to do a search for like, find all the places that have the word include, there's one, another, and then I just jump through them. And there's a variety of other things one can do. And there are more sophisticated tools than etags for doing indexing uh, with Emacs as well. Now, IDEs have all this kind of functionality built in. So things like searching through your source code, finding functions, finding documentation, and so forth, are all there. And it really pays off to be able to um, use a tool. So no more grepping through your directories to find some function because you forgot where it is. You should be using these tools to access them. Okay, now I'm working on the back to the make file, working on extending the make file a little bit more to make it more general and usable. 
So rather than hardwiring directly into the um, rule for the example, the names of all the source codes, <coughs> I've just introduced a variable source C, which is the two files it depends on. And I've introduced a variable objects, which is the O versions of those C files. So the um, funny syntax on the right there, dollar sign source semicolon dot C equals dot O, says take the variables dot, the source variables, and replace all the dot Cs with dot Os. So this just tells me how get a list of all the dot O files. And now I can write EX8 depends on the object files, and to build it in the same way, it depends on the object files. So it's exactly the same code as before, except now what I've done is I've moved the specification of the dependence on particular files up to the top rather than having them being buried inside the rules. I can extend that a bit more. And what if I have a bunch of source files and I don't want to keep on having to remember to go into my make file and add the new source code when I, when I have a dependency on it? I can instead simply have the make file determine from the uh, file system what files need to be compiled. So in this case, I've used this dollar sign wildcard star 9.c. All that means is it looks in the file system for any file of the form star 9.c. So it'll be util 9.c and ex 9.c and define the source to be that. Note you could include, you can include directories or anything else you want in there. So it could look in several directories, generate a bigger list, um, whatever you, whatever you want to um, have it depending on. So there's one thing that still bothers me about this make file. And that's this util 9.0 depending on uh, util 9.h. I hate the fact that I have to maintain that myself and know about it. And if in the future, if I make some other source file dependent on util 9.h, and I forget to list it here, then when I recompile, it won't necessarily recompile exactly what has to be recompiled. And so you can get inconsistent code that doesn't work properly. So what I want is I want the tool to manage that for me. And fortunately, GNU Make has a nice, simple way to manage that for me. But it has to use a little more information than just the make itself. It has to get some information from the compiler. Because it's only the compiler that knows which include files are included by which source code files. So the next make file shows how we can have the compiler determine which C files depend on which H files and convey that information to the make file. So it, it's a little obscure syntax at the top here. I don't know why it's so obscure, but if you make this variable at the top output option and then those variables there, those are particular flags that tell most compilers, certainly the Clang compilers and the GCC compilers, they tell those compilers, figure out the include dependency information and save them to a file. And what they actually do is they save them to a file with the same name as the .c, except with a .d for dependency on it instead. So when you run the compiler with this funny output option and those flags there, it'll compile a code, but it'll also generate a .d file, which I'll show you in a second, that shows the dependencies of that .c file. And then in the source code in the, sorry, in the, uh, next part of the make file, instead of just having an objects, I also have a depends. And all that's saying is for each C file that's listed in source, depends is a list of files with the same names except ending in .d instead of .c. And then the next line, dash includes depends, is a GNU make thing that says include all the files that are listed here in depend. So it doesn't just include a single one necessarily, it include multiple ones at the same time. So let's first run that. Let's see what happens. Okay, so the only difference when I ran the, the make the first time is that it compiled with those two extra options. 
Now let's look at util 10.d. So util 10.d that's generated automatically the by the compiler actually looks like a little fragment of a make file because that's exactly what it is. And all it says is, well, util 10.0 depends on util 10.c and util 10.h, which is exactly the information we need. So the includes in the make file, basically the compiler's generating a bunch of little fragments of make file that we're now including into our, um, into our make file automatically. And any time you change the source code by putting another include in there, it'll automatically be tracked by this mechanism. Now if I run the make a second time, of course everything's up to date. Now let's just go touch util 10.c to 10.h. Let's see what happens with the make and hope that everything goes properly. All right, it recompiles the one piece of code and then generates the new executable. If I run it again, the dependency is already satisfied. It doesn't have to do anything new. Okay, now I'm going to add a little bit more to a make file. This is another convention people often, often do. Is it's useful if the make file can kind of tell you how to use it. Rather than me having to go into the make file and figure out what does the make file do, what I'd like to be able to do is just run the make with a help and get some message. So I've added at the bottom here a new rule, help, and all the help does is print a couple of things. So if I do make help, it prints the helpful information. But notice how it prints that helpful information. First of all, it prints uh, echo make ex11 make the executable. That is, it prints the message it's going to print, then it prints the message. Then it prints the second message it's going to print, and then it prints that message. That's kind of annoying to get that echo in there. So make has ways of determining whether the rules that you're going to execute are displayed before they're executed or not. And so let's just make, take a look at makefile 12. All I've done here is modified the makefile by putting a, a dash and an ampersand in front of the rule for echo. So now when I run make with this 11, with 12, sorry, it prints the help message without printing the echo of before. The dash and the ampersand mean two different things. One of them means that it won't print what it's going to do, execute before it executes it. And the other one means continue even if you find an error. Otherwise, what normally would make what, what, what can happen is as soon as it tries to do something that generates an error, it'll stop. And it may be, well, you have a lot of code that you want to compile. You actually want to get as much of it compiled as possible rather than having it stop at the first one. So the other one of these two, the dash and the ampersand, tells it that um, you should continue and do the next thing after this even if you fail on this thing. And I've been using make for 25 years and I do not remember to this day which of the dash means which and whether the ampersand means which. And I just try each one and see which one works. Question over here. Is there a way to automatically echo every uh rule in a make file uh, without having to modify the make file itself, like a, an option or environment variable or something like that. Like say you have a large third party make file or a collection of big make files and you're trying to debug. There is something that's useful, but you'll see the limitation of it. Um, it's not as simple, unfortunately, as I think we might think it would be to do that. So let's just uh, do that guy again. Make has a dash D debug. The problem is when you use it, an inconceivable amount of stuff comes out. And the reason is that make has a lot of built-in rules for doing things that have sort of 
accumulated over the years. So for example, if it can't find a source code, a source file, it's got a rule to go look for it in, under RCS, which was great 25 years ago. I took advantage of it then, but it's not so useful now. The problem is that it actually processes all these rules. And so if you run with the dash D option, you see all the things it's trying. And in theory, you can debug completely by using this. In practice, there's generally just too much information spewed out to actually see that. The specific thing you're asking about, whether the individual, those individual lines, I don't know. It's conceivable there is such an option. I don't actually know whether there is such an option or not. Okay, so the next thing I'm gonna do, instead of just building an executable, I'm gonna build a library. And here, here's something that I recommend for everybody, even if you don't think you're writing a library, even if you think you're writing only an application code. You really should organize your code into one or more libraries and then build your application code from those one or more libraries with maybe a small main or something. So rather than just having an executable that depends on 322.0 files, I would have my library depend on the .o files and then have an executable that just depends on the library or libraries. It's <laughs> organizing your code around a set of libraries gives you a really better way of thinking about its organization than just thinking of, oh, I'm dumping a whole bunch of .os directly in an executable. You can organize them into, well, these are my routines that do graphics, these are my routines that do the solving, these are my routines that do the discretization, and put them in different libraries. And you can organize make files to compile a, and manage a series of libraries instead of just one library. I'm just showing you a single library, but you can have it automatically update a collection of libraries based on source code as well. So I'm going to modify the make file again, take out the executable, and instead just have um, something called lib, which is going to depend on my object files. And it's going to be created using the AR routine, which creates static libraries and uh, Unix type, um, type machines. Now again, to make this make file portable, we wouldn't hardwire the AR CR command in the middle there. We'd set it up there at the top as variables for your archiver and your archiver flags. But for simplicity, I just have it written directly like this. And things work pretty much as expected. I can do make uh, lib goes ahead and creates the library. If I uh, run it again, oops, I run it again, it actually does something. That's kind of annoying. Doesn't really have the right dependencies in the sense that, um, yeah, it knows it doesn't have to rebuild the .os but it doesn't know about the library itself. And the reason for that is because I've chosen to give the rule a different name than the name of the library. And so what's happening is, even though it builds that libex13.a, uh, it doesn't know that that's the result of the lib. So I'm actually going to try here on the fly to change this. Things never work on the fly, but, and let's see if by naming it this, we can get what we want. Okay. Hmm. Okay, it did work. So now I have the dependencies right um, based on this naming. There's another way to do that using another feature of make. Now, it seems like there's lots of features of make. And in fact, there are lots of features of make. It takes a while to kind of get them all. And you, you should sort of start at the beginning and work your way up and don't think you're gonna just get all of them all at once. So, 
this is kind of a shorthand way of writing essentially what we wrote last time is, and I've gone back to the name lib here, lib depends on, now there's the name of the library with the parentheses around the object code that it depends on. And this is a, a make feature where it knows to go and look inside libx.a, check the, the dates on the .o files in there and determine whether they're out of date with respect to um, the .c files or not. So it'll automatically um, handle the dependency for you. Okay, so that's building a static library. What about building a shared library instead? So static libraries are really just a file that contains a concatenation of a bunch of .o files with no additional processing at all. When, you, when the linker builds an executable, all it does is search through those .o files and take the ones that it needs and sort of stick them on the end of the executable. So the executable file gets bigger and bigger. And now when you launch the executable, all the uh, symbols that are needed are in this executable file or somewhere or another, this single file. A drawback to uh, static libraries is when they get really big, it means that executables get really big because now it has to take all these .os and put them into the executable file. So you can have executable file that's hundreds of megabytes in size. And historically what's always happened is that um, it's become kind of slower to work with them and then a bit better depending on how quickly the file systems work over time. But shared libraries are a slightly different mechanism. In a shared library, rather than actually taking all the .os and sticking them into the executable file, the executable file just remembers where that shared library is. And then when you execute the executable um, file, it goes and looks for the objects that it needs from the shared libraries, but only when it needs to. So it doesn't load up everything in there. It doesn't have to copy everything in there. It's only, ah, oh, I have a new symbol. I'll go look in the shared library, see if it's there, and then I'll load that piece of the shared library and start working with it. So working with shared libraries generally means that linking is really a lot faster because it doesn't have to generate a big executable. It generates a really tiny executable that basically just has a pointer to the library. So the rules for making um, shared libraries are pretty much like making uh, object files, actually. So here I've written a rule at the bottom, lib16. Now, actually, let's go to the top first. I put up two new uh, variables here, shared library extension and shared library flag. Unfortunately, Unix uses .so for shared libraries. The Mac uses .dylib. It's just an annoying little feature they have. And then um, Microsoft uses its own extension on the end. So if you want to manage things portably, you've got to introduce a variable with the type of extension that you're going to be working with. And then, of course, different compilers and linkers have different flags for creating shared libraries. And on the Mac, it happens to be dash dynamic library. So now I've made a rule with those two, uh, those two variables here, lib16 dot dy lib, depends on the object files. And then to build it, you run the C compiler with the shared library flag. And then I introduce two new little features of make. This guy here and this guy here. This variable turns into the name of the rule. So this variable turns into this thing here. And this variable turns into everything that's on this list here. So I don't have to repeat putting this thing down here and this thing down here. Makes the make file a little simpler. Of course, very cryptic, strange characters and stuff. But you get used to it after a while. So let's just do make lib ex16 
There we go, builds the library. Run it again, you'd notice the library's already built, it doesn't have to uh, recompile anything there. Now take a look at the make file I have here. It sort of consists of two parts. <laughs> at the top, I have a list of variables that are kind of dependent on the particular machine and operating system that I'm working with. And then at the bottom, I have a set of rules for doing stuff, building exactly what I want to build. And these two parts are different in the sense that if I were to take this and, and want to use it on a Linux machine, Everything below that um, shared library flag is the same. Everything above that may be different on a different type of machine. So what I'm gonna do next is I'm gonna take that part that's machine dependent and put it somewhere else in a separate file. Because having it mixed in with these rules that are portable is confusing. It's better to have it separated out. So I'm gonna make a new make file. That's the old make file, except instead of setting the variables directly there, I'm gonna include what I called makefile17.config. And then below that is my set of rules for doing whatever I wanna do. And of course, you know exactly what's gonna be in makefile17.config. It's gonna be those variables. So fine, now if I go to a new machine, Linux machine, even a Windows machine, I don't have to go and change my make file in order to build stuff. I just have to go to this one place, makefile.config, and change the variables there to match the new machine. So that's great. It's a way to have some kind of portability. The drawback is, of course, you have to know what variables to go and change and what values to change them to and you're oftentimes not going to know what those values should be for a variety of machines. And there may not be just four or five uh, variables here, there might be a 20 or 30. So this is a, what I wanna talk about next in my presentation. We're moving away now from make to the GNU AutoConf and AutoTools. So GNU AutoConf and AutoTools started essentially as a way to have the machine automatically figure out and set for you the variables that are machine dependent that you work with with make. So, how do they do that? Well, first what you do is you make a, a file very similar to this file except rather than setting the values into that file, you set these kind of placeholders. So I've only done the very first one here is use ampersand and then the name of a variable and then ampersand again. And when you run the tools, they're gonna put into this file the correct value for this, which in this case is CC or whatever. I didn't do the other ones just because I didn't want to deal with them at this time, so I just left them hardwired there. So you'll see in a minute what I mean by this. And the file name is now makefile18.config.in. So you put a .in on the end, it's an input file for the auto tool system, and the output file will be makefile18.config. Then corresponding to that, you need a configure file. And again, it's called configure.in. This is the file that's the input to the tools. So it's gonna look a little hairy at first, but mostly it's just boilerplate. This is kind of the most basic autoconf uh, configure file you can start with. Basically, it says an AC init, it's just saying I'm starting my file. And at the end, you have an AC output, which just says, do all the output of all the files that I asked you to process. The second line from the bottom says that my configure files, my only configure file is actually make file, 
18.config.in. The uh, .in is implicit there. So what it knows is it's got to look for the file, make file 18.config.in, do the textual substitutions of the variables in that file, generating the new file, makefile.18.config. And then in the middle, I'm using one of the uh, scripts, if you will, or functions of autoconf, which is uh, check for a program. So all it's doing is saying AC check program says, look for the programs, Clang, GCC, XLC, and I got a comma in there by mistake, or I'm missing some commas, I guess they don't matter. XLC, ICC, and if you find, the first one you find that works, go and set it to the variable CC, variable big CC. So that's why over here, I have this ampersand big CC ampersand here. That's gonna be replaced by the program that's found by the other routine. And this is just some, oh, this ACC stub, uh, subst, I think is the one that says actually do the substitution of the CC. So let's see what happens if I do this. So the input first is I need to run autoconf on, actually, let's see. Autoconf, by default, works on the file configure.in, so you don't even have to pass the name. There's a ways to pass the name of the file if you, if you change it. And now this will have generated a makefile18config. There's two steps with Autoconf. The person who's uh, supplying the package runs autoconf. Then when you get the package, you run the resulting configure script to actually figure out the answer for you. And that's the thing that you run on your machine. So in fact, after I run the autoconf, I now have to run configure. And you see what it's doing. It puts a little information about what it's doing. And in this case, it's just checking for compilers. It fang, found Clang, it thinks it works, it finds out a little bit of information about it. Um, I can do something like configure cc equals gcc. Now it'll use a gcc compiler, because I've decided I wanted to use the gcc compiler. If I put in like my compiler, It says, doesn't exist, so it rejects it. So let's run again, let's run with this one, and now let's look at um, makefile 18.config. There it is, it's got the GCC in there, so we know that it processed it. And now we can just do make ex18, and it's using GCC this time. Now let's run configure again, going back to Clang. Let's see what happens here. Well, I did something right and wrong. I changed the compiler, but it doesn't really know that I changed the compiler, so it thinks all the dependencies are right. I'd actually have to put into the make file a dependency on the on the compiler to get it to rebuild everything if I change the compiler. But I haven't done that, so it thinks, of course, that everything is already built. So I'd actually have to do, uh, um, let's do a make clean. There, and now it rebuilds it this time with Clang. Uh, this is another thing that almost always you find in make files are rules for uh, cleaning. 
So you just make a rule called clean and it removes generic stuff like .os. And generally there's also another rule called real clean, which tries to clean up everything in sight, things that normally you might not want to clean up, like, like the actual libraries that are built and so forth. Okay, there's one more feature I want to show you. And let's see. Here we go. So, sadly, different machines are a little different. They have different include files, if a different version of the OS, or if it's a different OS, things are slightly different in different places. So if you're making a complicated package that depends on these differences, you want to write your code to be portable and not require the user to go and edit those things. Um, but you don't want to put a lot more complication into the code. So here's an example of a classic situation which has actually, fortunately, over the years, gotten better and better. But in, in the past, in Unix, it was terrible. Every variant of Unix had slightly different include files with different names and slightly different stuff in them. There's still some today that are problematic, but it's not as bad as it used to be. So for example, some systems have string.h, some systems have strings.h, some systems have both, some systems have neither. So, how can we deal with that kind of thing if we want to have code that'll build in all these different situations? So the autocomp tools can manage this kind of process as well, and I'll show you sort of an extension of what they did before. Was So in your source code, you have to put in conditional compiles. So in this case, I put in a conditional if, if defined have string h, then include string h, um, else if defined have strings h, then include strings h. I don't really actually use it anywhere, but you can imagine you're using this for some reason or another. So the autoconf tools have lots of different kinds of checkers for things. And one of them, fortunately really simple to use, is a checker for whether include files exist. So all I'm doing is now adding to my configure.in a check. Tell me if string h exists. Tell me if strings h exist. It does more than actually go and look for the file. It actually compiles with that file and makes sure that file is actually compilable with the compiler that you have at that time. So it's a very useful check. So let's just um, copy this configure19.in to configure.in, run the autoconf again, now what is the autoconf tool doing, I'll just show you quickly because this leads to lots of confusion, is this is sort of a high level language for specifying things you want to look for. The problem is no system comes with a compiler or, or a interpreter for this high level language. And what the autoconf tools do is they take this high level thing and they convert it to the lowest imaginable shell scripting language that's portable, guaranteed by the GNU authors, portable to any Unix system or anything like a Unix system anywhere. So after I've run this, it generated a script called configure. And it's put some nice comments in to explain what's in there. There's lots of gibberish in there. It's really hard to understand. Because it has to compile it down to something that's known to be portable, which means it can't take advantage of nice features of new bash or Python or anything else like that. So it's a pretty horrible looking thing. You don't edit and work directly with this file unless you're Bill Grupp, but nobody else does. And you barely understand what's going on in there. But occasionally you might have to look and figure out why it's doing something at a particular place. But usually it's not important. But see, look, it generated this huge monstrous thing. But that's okay, all I do is run it. And in this case, it's checking not only the compilers, 
that I asked for at the top. But you see it's also checking for a bunch of header files. By default, if you ask to check for a particular header file, it'll check for a bunch of them just for whatever reason. So now it's checked that these things um, exist. And oh yeah, there's one other thing that I didn't show you in the make file here, is I have another output file from the configure, ac configure headers configure.h. It's gonna output a file configure.h, which we can look at here, config.h, and all it puts in there is whatever it found. So in this case, define have string h and define have strings h. So what I've tried to do in my presentation are three main things. First, a little bit about using your editing tools, learn your tools, because they can be very powerful and make you much more efficient. Um, the second topic that I've worked on is make files. And the power of make files is you can put in any kind of complicated rules for compiling code. Usually they shouldn't be complicated. They can handle managing dependencies, figuring out dependencies for you. So only the code that needs to get recompiled gets recompiled. You can use them for other things like printing help messages, generating tag files, uh, cleaning up the directories. It used to be that I would recommend trying to just use make instead of GNU make, but GNU make is, really seems quite portable now. I've never come across a machine in many years that doesn't support GNU make. So nowadays I think just go hog wild and use GNU make syntax as much as you need to make your package um, as simple as possible. Of course, if you have a one-liner, you might as well just use make. And then finally, auto tools. Auto tools are a way of filling in the pieces that are missing from working with make files. That is, determining properties of the system that your package depends on that are unique to that system, and then passing them off to the compilers and the make files and so forth so that things get built properly using um, those pieces. Final slide. There's an alternative make, a new make, autoconf. They seem rather big and complicated and everything. There's an alternative to, the, to this system called CMake. CMake has some really nice features. One feature is you can get it to work with Microsoft Visual Studio, which you can't really get to work with the autoconf make tools. Of course, who in their right mind wants to use Microsoft Visual Studio, but lots of people have to use it. Um, it works really well transparently with IDEs, so you can ha it'll build all the stuff that Eclipse needs in order to build your package, for example, including all the things related to um, code uh, function name completion and, and searching through the source code and so forth, so really nice. I don't particularly like it, that's why I'm talking about um, make and, and um, configure. I'm not an expert on CMake, you really want to talk to an expert on CMake on how to use it, not an expert on how to use it. Uh, I found that it's difficult to debug. Of course, people say the same thing about auto tools that they're difficult to debug. So, I'll take uh, any questions. Uh, when you generated the library or when you generate the .o from the .c, I don't see any, any compilation line in your make files that generates the .o from the .c or the static library from the .o, that object file. Very good point. So, Make has a lot of built-in rules for doing uh, .o to .a, .c to .o. You can override those by putting in your own rules and explicitly saying, so um, explicitly calling the compiler in the same way that when, you, when I built the executable. Generally, there's no reason to do that, but because basically what it does is it calls the compiler with a standard set of flags, such as C flags. So, you never want to put into a make file anything that's redundant. So you would put the rule in if, if you have a particular file that's compiled in some bizarre way that's not standard, then you would put the rule in. Otherwise, you wouldn't put the rule in. But you can put the rule in. And they do exist, and you can write them out, but they're default ones, so that's why you don't see them, because I didn't bother to put them down, yeah. <clears throat> so for a larger project where you say you you use um, like a few libraries instead of one big piece of code. 
Um, is there a possibility to have like a cascaded process with uh, which is able to handle large scale um, directory structures? I'm not sure what you're getting at. Um, so if I have like uh, I have my main program and I have yep. four libraries right. that each of the libraries has its own uh, make file and I have a central make file which I usually invoke. Right, there are several ways you can do that. One is to have each part have more or less its own self-contained make file. That, so for each library it just builds that library. Another way is to have a single make file that has the rules for the sub-libraries. Now, <clears throat> there's advantages and disadvantages to both. Um, the feature that I did not mention is the parallel compiling aspect of make. GNU make can compile source code in parallel if it knows the source code should be, you know, is available to be built. So this is one advantage of organizing things into a single make file is the more parallelism that you tell it about dependencies on objects, it can automatically utilize all that and really do the parallelism well. While if you have four separate packages, you either have to trigger them all at the same time, which you don't really want to do, or you have to go through them one at a time. Make files and configure files and CMake files are source code. Source code needs to be maintained, it needs to be refactored over time. Oftentimes, people have a package that's accumulated a lot of autoconf and a lot of make stuff over the years, and it's a big mess. It's really hard to understand. It's hard to simplify and so forth. And that's because the developers of the package were irresponsible. In the same way that if you have a bunch of source code and you don't maintain it and it becomes a big mess over time, you've been irresponsible and it's your fault that it's hard to maintain. You should be refactoring your make files or your CMake and your autoconf on a regular basis and keeping it clean and simple. And if you do that, you can actually have a single make file that can compile a bunch of different libraries with proper dependencies, and it doesn't have to be some god-awful spaghetti monster. And in fact, it shouldn't be some big spaghetti monster. There's, it's, it's in a sense understandable but inexcusable why that happens. And it's not the fault of the tools, it's the fault of the not following the constant refactoring of them. So yeah, I would put them together because of the parallel aspects of the builds will generally be much faster. This is uh, perhaps a simple question. Um, you mentioned that there are two input files to autoconf. Uh, there's the configure.in and there's the, anyway, so I couldn't tell from the two input files where you've told it to uh, build the libraries, at least I couldn't, so maybe if you can go back to the two input files and just point out to me. Oh, that's actually, I think what you mean is managed by the make file. Is that the same question earlier, perhaps? There's really three input files for the autoconf in this case, in this final case. There's the configure.in, which is this set of things I want it to do, and then there's the make file dot configure dot in and the configure dot h dot in. I didn't actually show you the config. Didn't actually show you this. It's really obscure, strange thing. Um, you just undeath everything and then the um, configure automatically goes and changes those to def the ones that it finds. Sorry, I, th I think I'm still a little bit confused because I still don't see where you specified um, it to build a li the library of the first oh, C file. So the make file rules are, are in here oh, exactly the same as before. Okay. Remember, this part is independent of the operating system and so forth, so it doesn't change even though you're using autoconf. You're, you still using, you're still using regular make files if you use this approach. So, and we still have to write that ourselves? Is that, that's the? Y yes. But actually, it gets more complicated than that. In general, they should be small, and they don't change that much over time, so they're not supposed to be a big deal. Now, there is an advanced feature in the GNU Auto Tools, Auto Make and other things, that actually make the make files for you. I don't actually recommend that. There's actually no reason. They were developed kind of before GNU Make was great. 
But now GNU Make is great. It can handle all that complexity itself. So I don't actually recommend using that level. I recommend using the level that I've shown here, which is GNU Make files and then simple autoconf to do variable replacement of everything. There's no reason in my mind for most of um, high performance computing for us to go beyond that and use anything else.